Hey guys, good evening. Welcome to the very last slot in the open document uh, added to staff room. Um, happy to have so many of you still here. It was a great day. Um, wonderful program here in this room, so thanks to all the uh, open office and liberal office and who else was here? Uh, Bitergia guys um, presenting. So let's finish off this day uh, with a session of lightning talks. Um, we got seven um, uh, talks recruited here. Perhaps one more if we have the time in the end. Um, here's the rules. Everyone got five minutes. Um, I'm having some stopwatch here. Um, 30 seconds before time's up, I will be standing and looking at you. And at the five minute sharp, we will all kind of get up and and give you some applause, so to properly cut you off in a friendly way. And then the next guy comes up. Um, so the order is um, two times Marcus Mohart, uh, then Swante, then Samuel. Um, and then I forget. Uh, oh yeah, Core two times, and Jaimux in the end. So without further ado, Marcus. Marcus, uh, Marcus, will talk about Marcus will talk about UI hacks. Marcus is one of the um, one of the early uh, contributors to the project. Has been active since I think March uh, 2011. So here you go, Marcus. Thanks. So I will talk a bit about uh, UI testing. There was a tender from TDF uh, about a year ago, I think, about uh, developing a UI testing framework. We have a lot of testing frameworks already for uh, normal stuff, but developing a UI testing framework is not that simple. There, there are a lot of different approaches, but most of them have some really, really ugly parts. Um, I think that the best ones at the moment are uh, on the uh, for web stuff, but yeah, I've been thinking about that for for many years. Um, so I've designed one and implemented it as part of the tender. It, it's an own implementation. It has two parts. We have an introspection library in the LibreOffice code that. Uh, provides uh, information about our UI elements to the outside world and uh, allows us to send commands to these UI elements. So it's a short, uh, a really, really short layer above our UI elements and uh, VCL. And then uh, we connect to that uh, introspection code with uh, Python code through uh, a UNO interface, a really, really simple UNO interface, so that writing the Python code does not require any new, uh, UNO uh, knowledge. Uh, if anyone has ever done some UNO coding, you know that not requiring a UNO is actually a feature and not a bug. Um, element discovery, so finding a UI element in, and for example a button in a dialog happens through the uh, uh, IDs that we have in UI files. The, the advantage of using the, the IDs is that they should be stable and, and that they are locally unique. So if you have a dialog uh, it should be unique and if you move for example the button to, to a different place in the same dialog you should still get the, the same button uh, by going through the ID. And well, our Java API test framework that we inherited from openoffice.org uh, suffers from a lot of sleeps uh, that are random and if a test fails and you notice, okay, let's increase the sleep time a bit and it does not fail anymore, you realize, okay, you don't want to have sleeps in your test frameworks. In UI tests, where a lot of uh, things happen uh, unpredictably, you need a way to, to issue a command and wait until the event has happened. For that, we, we send now events for quite a few things uh, and listen to the events on, on the uh, testing framework side uh, and resume our work as soon as the events are there. 
So, what's good about the framework? Um, most of our UI elements are already covered. So, uh, most of the stuff that you find in a dialog uh, has uh, part of this introspection library support. Um, the elements are easily discoverable by the uh, framework, so you can address them. Most of them have an ID. Some of them uh, have none yet, especially the ones that we create and don't load from UI files. Um, <laughs> that helps also that we don't have any test failures if you just change the dialogue a bit. If our UX guys decide once again, let's re uh, redo the dialogue as long as they keep the idea. Yeah, the test will still work. Um, because it's our own code, uh, we can support any feature that we have in LibreOffice for, for users. Uh, anything as complex as we want it, we can implement it on our side. And quite importantly, we, we can place the code at the correct location so that it's <coughs> as close to the code path taken by user events as possible. Um, which also <laughs> helps in finding bugs. So uh, the bad, the ugly, as I mentioned, no UI testing framework is perfect. Um, yeah, I if you want to support a new UI element, like a special type of button, you would need to add some code to the LibreOffice core to make it available on the Python side. Um, because you have to change LibreOffice, you can't just run the tests uh, against uh, any older version. The tests are quite slow. Uh, loading LibreOffice takes quite some time, waiting until the UI is ready even more. So currently, a normal test is around five seconds. And yeah, we, we need to maintain our own framework, which is good to some degree, but also, again, some work for us. That's it. Uh, Cisco is already writing tests, so with that, so uh, apparently it works. If you want to do it, talk to me. I will help you. Wonderful. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Marcus. Yeah. Next uh, question. <laughs> yeah, quickly. Uh, yeah. Um, the, on the one side, you, you make no pauses. On the other side, you want to be to user uh, behavior, users make pauses. Yeah, but uh, we, we don't. Need, uh, yeah, we don't need uh, these sleeps that okay. we have. So that's why we have these events. So we yeah. wait until the event is done. Okay, I see. So you just cut out the uh, sleep phases of the user. Yeah, uh, the, the unnecessary sleep okay. phases. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so. I, I talked about UI testing while uh, looking at our uh, manual testing, which was uh, more or less the source for all our UI tests in the beginning. Well, we did not have an automatic UI testing framework. We used manual testing for that, um, which looks a bit like that. Uh, you, you have a simple instruction. You repeat that. But yeah, it, it somehow doesn't scale. How do you do it in the future if you want to increase uh, the tests? How if you want to do more tests, uh, run it on more platforms? Do you want to do that? Trust more uh, people uh, doing stupid instructions that, that were written down? Um, or do you want to actually use that? That scales perfectly. Like take an Amazon uh, cloud. You could do as much work as you want. So I've started working on that recently. Uh, the idea comes from the uh, crash reporting that I wanted to test, and which has some uh, problems that we can't cover in our current test framework. Um, so these tests run on, on currently on release builds. Um, and the idea would be that we start a virtual machine, do whatever we want there. We have a clean state. We have, can install any dependency that we want. Uh, we can test the integration with the system. For example, does uh, the installation work? Uh, does the connection to uh, another service work? All the stuff that we currently can't do in our tests because it either requires to change the system or because it requires some dependencies that we can't assume in our tests. 
Um, I, I've uh, uh, part of uh, our repository, uh, some tests already for the crash reporting. Um, I have some ideas how to do it a bit better with the VMs. There's uh, some Python frameworks that you can use. Um, and I want to do that for a number of things that we currently have in the manual test that we can't cover with the UI tests. But taking the UI tests into these tests allow us to, to more or less do whatever a user does, um, even if it requires changing the system. I think that's all. Hey. <laughs> Test, test. Can you hear me? Oh. Somebody start? Hi. Um, I want to talk about um, changes, and uh, I hope that in a few years we can use a different David Bowie song, maybe Heroes. So hopefully we can do this way. So I want to talk about ODF. So what is from one side, ODF is just um, the state of the user's work, right? It can be used by, but it's used by LibreOffice. It was derived from StarOffice, so it's very typical to LibreOffice. Maybe that's one of the reasons that LibreOffice is so dominant here in the ODF editor dev room, right? And it consists, like we heard before, about XML, so and images is quite open. But there's a different angle. ODF is also a blueprint, it's an interface between different applications, right? So um, that's very important here. It is specified by Oasis where companies and people like me uh, might join and it's a blu blueprint that others use this to um, use the data and give it to someone else, like once on floppy disk. And also very important, it's an ISO standard. There are many standards, but the ISO standard is very important because this is only been done by countries like Dean in Germany. And also very important, a country like Great Britain, um, Netherlands did, can say we have to or we, we demand that this file format is being used. And this is very, very important because some, you might there's the biggest impact that ODF had was on Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft created in a very, very small amount of time the OXML standard. And it's not even <laughs> the name, maybe you know it, it was confusing me a lot in the beginning. The first version of um, open document format was called OpenOffice XML, but then was changed because it was too specific to one application. So if we go to a standard, we want to use um, more generic name so other uh, people can join, <laughs> yes? So it's called, um, was, this name was dropped, Office Open, uh, and Office Open XML was born by just switching the, the words. I find it very interesting that they did it. And um, the, the most interesting part is, why did they do this? I mean, why did they invest so much money into creating their own ISO standard? And to be honest, I'm not sure, but it has to do with the ISO standard that governments can um, demand that uh, companies have to fulfill this standard. And I believe that's what I heard, that it's like a domino chain, but this time it started from the biggest player, the governments, going to people like SAP and Oracle, were large companies that supply this file format. So there's a lot, lot power in this. And I guess this is all quite often forgotten here, um, that when I talk at the table, um, I want to sell my, uh, my, my software and I care about, let's say, LibreOffice, and I can't sell ODF, I don't care about ODF, yes? This is very powerful, I cannot explain how it's powerful and cannot estimate it, but they, they did it once, and I believe there's a reason that they have to do it again, and there's a, maybe a leverage how to, um, how to break the monopoly on the business market. So, First, what are the obstacles that we do currently have? There are some of them. So first of all, collaboration. Um, it's not good enough to send documents around. These times are over. Like nowadays we all have smartphones, we are all connected. And um, so sending these documents around is uh, 
it's not good enough because you don't know what the others has changed. You want to merge easily. And if we do it for software, all the developers know we have source control system for the files and you can do merges there and we have no way to say like in, like in Git for source code, what is the, what's the diff? And this should be defined by changes. The next time there's no runtime API like HTML had uh, with the DOM. This is very important for third party software and there's one of the biggest obstacles for, for selling. And last time there's no feature testing. Uh, testing. If I want to buy me a machine then I took like a test and what's the fe uh, feature de um, comparison? And nowadays I see applications that de uh, they um, say oh we support ODF but when I test a few documents I realize they're very lousy and um, there should be better testing and this is not possible yet you can only load save and, and test but if we would have something like a feature testing then we would be very powerful so how we do it as I said with changes the documents are too large and what we're doing we're not we're going on a higher level and we say something like I've changed the one millionth paragraph to red that's what I did and we um, we abstract from the details like XML, we go to what the user knows. By this we can um, go across as many applications as possible. And of course I talked about this um, earlier, we have to refer to a certain version that uh, developers know, they use hash, but not again on XML because of verbose, we use it on this logical box. So what scenarios do we have in mind? It's, as I said, I can do like in GitHub, um, I clone the document or there's a read-only document and I said, oh, by the way, there's a typo. I would like to fix it. I only send this small change. Or if you say have a contract and then you uh, return only the change, not the full contract with some kind of hidden changes I'm not aware of, you can exchange no longer only documents but changes. This is very powerful. And also a versioning system like give me all the changes since I was vacation and also powerful you can sign the document, this is based currently in the XML not the zip, and this signed document can be documented um, and changed by um, change the site and still you have the signed document. So you can do a ping pong of documents with, with signing which is currently not possible on. There are a lot of other features and I want to tell you that this should be our future and you shouldn't get this ISO standard opportunity out of your mind. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next. Willst du anfangen mit Hintergrund oder? So, next one is um, kind of, I, I think I'm going to share that with uh, Samuel. By the way, Samuel, another one of the early LibreOffice uh, contributors, I think June 2011 yeah. was your, your first. Uh, <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> so this is about uh, something that we just started to do. Um, uh, the project's called GPG for Libra. It's about integrating uh, the new privacy guard into uh, LibreOffice. Is it, this is all about document signing and document encryption based on public key uh, cryptography um, using um, lots of cool stuff that's already out there. Um, the project is um, funded by the German Federal Agency for Information Security. They do all kinds of things like audits, um, like um, uh, security recommendations, but they also look into um, how to strategically um, change the software landscape to make everybody more secure, and this is um, one of that. Um, <clears throat> So um, conceptually, um, it's about um, using uh, the GNU GPG, GNU Privacy Guard, and another uh, and a set of auxiliary tools that are there, like um, key management and uh, integration, for example, into Windows. Um, and there's a nice um, um, API wrapper for that, uh, GPG ME, uh, that goes via IPC uh, to out of process tools and kind of offload all the security relevant stuff uh, to, to those tools. So LibreOffice doesn't really have to bother with uh, keeping the, 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 the passphrase secure and not uh, screwing up with the, with the algorithms. So, and in the end, what should, what should, what should happen is that LibreOffice is able to um, sign documents and also encrypt documents uh, with, um, um, so sign documents with your private key and encrypt documents for uh, recipients 
that you have the public key for. So you, you find it on a key server and you're able to encrypt the document for that recipient. Um, the advantage to the uh, established X51 um, certificates is that it's much better for uh, decentralized organizations um, because you always have the problem if you are not a single company how to distribute the keys without trusting an external source like a CA um, for that. Um, so, want to take over from here? Yeah, <laughs> can do, but I don't know what I'm expecting. Um, screenshots. Yeah, screenshots. <laughs> Yeah, the first steps we did was uh, to make it more, um, how do you say, when the document the encryption is broken, uh, the signature, the current signature, um, there was a dialogue shown <coughs> earlier, um, which not even had a warning box or something, uh, so no icon, just a, a wall of text and you could easily, easily ignore it. Uh, so the first thing we did, uh, put an info bar, a red info bar when the signature is broken and uh, orange one um, when it has issues like an untrusted um, certificate or um, earlier open office versions and signed only parts of the document. Yeah. And the next steps are uh, yeah, we are currently integrating GPG for me uh, into LibreOffice to build it, and there is a small wrapper for C++, which makes it even easier to use. Um, we'll be also integrating that. I think that's called GPG for me++ or something. Um, yeah, and then we're going to um, make the your own certificates, uh, your own keys visible in the digital signatures dialog so you can use the existing dialog to sign with GPG and later on also encrypt. Yeah, and there's all sort of, of wonderful um, follow-up projects there so including um, PDF signing um, and and stuff like for, for documents so for PDF there's a nice feature that you when you sign a PDF then there's a little area where, where you can put some, some facsimile of, of your actual signature there that then gets integrated to the document and something that's like that would be really nice to have for ODF as well. It needs a little bit of, it needs some kind of field, special purpose field then to, to, um, to contain that. And um, uh, so for this signature stuff, I think that should be covered by the existing ODF spec. Um, I think for encryption, we will probably have to propose something to the ODFTC, <clears throat> but that's the second step. Um, okay, so that's about it. It's broadly an announcement that we start working on that, so then this is the first steps there. Any questions? Two Core. questions. Yes. Um, I think it's a good improvement that uh, when the signature is broken, that it's on the info bar. Uh, how does it behave when there's already an info bar? showing some classification info. They are stuck in uh, uh, Yeah, they will be stuck on each other, okay. so they all will be shown. Great. So um, you, can, you can have a full screen of info bars. Ah, love that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second question, so it's uh, um, um, uh, you mm. mentioned PDF signing, uh, uh, signing uh, new, newly created PDFs, you meant yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's already pretty nice PDF signing, but it's still using. I mean, it's it's again using this X five for one um, keys, and it would be great to do that with uh, GPG keys as well. I have no idea. It might be completely un unfeasible, but it would be nice. <laughs> nice. Still, I haven't looked into the into the PDF spec there. But we're running out of time. Sorry, guys. Um, next one up is uh, I think Ucore. Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, Core is going to uh, talk a little bit about... Uh, about here since 2010? It Core is here since forever. <laughs> Core is one of the founders of the Document Foundation, has been active uh, in the Open Office Org project since, I don't know, 2002, Four, three, five. Four, five. okay. <laughs> Not too early. Okay. Uh, yes, you go. Uh, just keep. Uh, so... Um, uh, Torsten tapped on my shoulder some uh, hour or so ago if I was interested in a lightning talk. Uh, so I couldn't make a choice, as, as usual. So uh, I got permission for two lightning talks. And I think I want to sh start with this one. And that's about uh, Document Foundation. Uh, Many of you will know, and some or many maybe won't know, about all the good work that's being done behind the scenes to support uh, 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 the development of this uh, great ODF uh, tooling, uh, it's called LibreOffice. And the Document Foundation, it, it's the foundation behind it, and apart from the, the LibreOffice project, it also hosts the um, Document Liberation Fronts. Uh, so, uh, uh, providing all the nice uh, document filters and adding new ones to that. So, very short. Mixed up with the front of document liberation. Huh? <laughs> Not to be mixed up with the front of document liberation. Oh, there's, there's all, all kinds of fronts. <laughs> it's, it's the document liberation project, to be honest, but <laughs> it's just so. Yeah. I, I like liberation fronts. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, TDF is the house at LibreOffice. And uh, yes, w we started in uh, about 2010, and there's a solid uh, Berlin based stifting behind it and statues and all the stuff. But what is it about? Uh, basically, uh, people that are active uh, working on all kinds of LibreOffice stuff can say, I, I want to be a member. And later I will explain to you why it is important to be a member. And, and, and of course, there is a, uh, there, uh, you, you can be uh, accepted as a member for one year, and after a year you are invited to apply again if you are doing good stuff. Uh, and there's a membership committee, it's mentioned below, that's uh, looking over the process of people being member or not. Uh, in between there's the board of directors and the board of directors does great stuff uh, to make uh, the whole thing uh, the whole whole thing going on and both the membership committee and the board of directors obviously are chosen from the members and then we have the engineering steering committee where all this engineers and people that are related and interested to uh, discuss about what's really going on and uh, an, not an official body in, in the sense that it has voting rights or whatever, it's the advisory board, all kind of organizations interested. And this is the last slide about TDF and this is uh, how it uh, shows uh, the board of trustees uh, below. It, it's not just members but there's also some formal uh, legal uh, legal roles, that's why it's called Board of Trustees. Um, and from the Board of Trustees we choose the membership committee uh, every two years and the other two years, uh, so that's uh, intermediate, uh, the Board of Directors is chosen. And why the Board of Directors is, is so very important, because uh, LibreOffice uh, uh, ap apart from all the great stuff that developers do, there's a lot of work uh, all behind the scenes uh, that's enabling the work uh, in, in case of infrastructure and people supporting uh, tooling and, and whatever. And, and that is made possible by all people that make donations and the board of directors uh, knits all together and finds uh, uh, the... Uh, the, the projects and the, the tooling that needs support. So the board of directors looks after uh, spending uh, money well for LibreOffice development. So that's about TDF and anyone uh, interested uh, in, in being a member, because if you are a member you can vote or even stand for the board of directors, uh, is welcome to go to document foundation, documentfoundation.org. So far, this one. So, that was my presentation 
one. Anyone else? Questions? TDF? Okay. Uh, then, uh, on top here in the... Uh, maybe I'll just start. Uh, uh, the, the second thing I want to talk about is, is a product called Libralex. Uh, and let me just show it. Uh, Libralex is something that uh, gives you a dialogue uh, to start document production. And it has some nice features and it has some old school sites as well. Uh, it started years ago. Uh, uh, I, I'm running a small company in the Netherlands and we're doing some uh, support for organizations using LibreOffice and prior to that OpenOffice.org. And um, uh, th this is typically old school uh, uh, within your office application. You start something and to create your documents. And even uh, a long time ago, it was all hard coded. And this is flexible, it's based on uh, configuration files. So here, if you choose another <coughs> document, uh, you see that this. This dialogue, dialogue is dynamically built, rebuilt, based on the, uh, on the configuration files. Um, and if let, let me take this one. As you see, there is some language information here. And you have some listers. Dear Madam, and if you choose to make it English, you see that both the dates and the list, all the stuff changes. It's all based on configuration files and you have, if you prefer, you have settings. Well, also you can have choices in templates for presentations, for example. And if you have a, this is a memo document and you can start it. And this is a demo. And when you hit OK, you get both a document and you get some predefined file naming. And you can start <laughs> editing the content in case uh, it's in some protected section, or whatever stuff, you can edit it. And there is some stuff that you m might want to print it with logo on black and white or send it as PDF or stuff like that, and emailing that it automatically is mailed as PDF with logo or as Word file to someone if he needs to edit it. That's that kind of stuff that makes working in a, um, in an uh, office document often easier. Uh, there, there's one thing that I want to show about flexibility. Um, so we have the the memo document here, and for example, uh, this it can be made uh, shorter, this field, and you can add extra fields, and I can show that. Um, here's the configuration file, and I just prepared some new lines, and <coughs> I have to save it, uh, of course. And you see, now this is a short one, and additionally there's this type of information available. Well, that's all nice and, and fun. And I started to open source this last year. This is now open source, the code. Uh, it's all uh, old school uh, basic. Uh, old school basic. Uh, I open sourced it. Uh, it was in the in in the uh, in the planning anyway. And there was some some bug in in the dialogue handling <laughs> with uh, GTK three or whatever. And that's fixed now. Um, but if you look at the configuration stuff, that's a bit old school. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, 
the ideas are that it's, uh, it's, it, it can be easily linked to document uh, management services or that you create a document from a document management system and that uh, if, if it is needed it can be uh, picked up in LibreOffice and do stuff with, uh, uh, with auto text uh, files and stuff like that. That's all, well, ideas that are possible in future. This is just uh, how it uh, should be to start from. Yes? Where is the code? Uh, it, it's just here, and when it's published somewhere, I, I, I can just share it with you, but it's not okay. yes, not in a public repository yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes? What's the license going to be? Um, what is it? Uh, I'm, I, I'm not in licenses. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, uh, yeah, I, I, there must be some, I, I think it's LGLP3 plus, something like that. Or perhaps? Yeah. So, yes? <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, we have two more talks. Um, JMOX, perhaps? When you're done? <laughs> I think we have time for what you want to do. Okay, this is very lightning because I just made those slides. So, um, next, next one up was uh, uh, Jan Marek Glogowski from uh, City of Munich. Uh, one of the really large German deployments of LibreOffice, some 17k seats, I think, uh, running LibreOffice, most of them on Linux. And he's been, you've been active in the project since when, 2008, 9? So, the last two years, something like that. And I need to output. Hmm. Um, settings? Mm, nee, das ist nur ein Window Maker. Muss nicht festdrehen. <lacht> Oder so. Ist das der richtige Punkt? Oder muss es andersrum sein? Kann ich überhaupt schnell? Ja. Ich brauche nur den Computer. Das Punkt? Hm. Ich kann nur mal abschließen. Ich nehme meinen, das kriege ich. Okay, so instead, we are, while we're solving the technical issues, um, this is Olivier, and you will be talking about the new help system. Yes, I would like to show you uh, what we have achieved so far. It's basically uh, a new, uh, new URL, it's vm173.documentfoundation.org. And uh, 
Of course, we have some issues on the on the CSS, but what we have here is a, a an imitation of what is the help system. This is the browser. This is the page rendered by uh, the transformation. We have also collected all the bookmarks in the XHP files, and if you click on uh, one of these, uh, you get the page. And on the top, you have a search bar that if you type a specific keyword, it's supposed to be uh, to collect all the mentions of calc into this, uh, and then you can then navigate. I have one more uh, things to show. Uh, what we, you see here is, is uh, on the debugging uh, the XML. Uh, you see that you can, uh, this is pure uh, HTML that is, has been transformed, okay? So we try to preserve, yes. What we have the, here is uh, only the, the index.xml, which is the entry page. There is a, there is a, a JavaScript uh, microserver running there. Okay, so that takes the uh, the links and transforms uh, inside with JavaScript. I also would like to show if you can type after the URL uh, slash index dot html and then a qu question mark yeah question mark page equal equal uh, share it share it slash test dot x h p test dot uh, x h p p yeah so i have modified the transformation to include new multimedia so you can uh, have uh, the page with the multimedia right now on the browser at, but you can't have it on the current help system so if you start the multimedia it goes to youtube and brings you the okay so this is what we have achieved so far in trying to bring uh, the help system into a more modern uh, um, technology. That's it. Okay. And just one thing, uh, we plan. I think it's a good idea to have this system bundled into an extension. Okay. So it, so it can. What? It may be interesting to distribute in a different way rather than installing packages. Okay, and it can be it can run uh, locally or in a server. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me try to. Um, can you help me? Which what's the name of the of your slides? My slides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other one. Plugfest? No. Erste. The, this one? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, after those technical problems, uh, old laptop and everything. Um, this is just a little overview about the stuff I've, I've been doing in Munich for the last two months, something like that, with some breaks. Basically, uh, the, the uh, LibreOffice processes all stuff to do in an event loop. In LibreOffice, it's called a task loop. And the, the current origin, where I'm coming from, is yeah, we are, there are two different types of tasks. Some are timers, which are somewhere executed in the, in the future, and some are idles, which are executed uh, instantly. Basically, there is some definition of busy, so at some point, LibreOffice says I'm busy, so at this point, no idle task should run, but this is very strange implemented in different backends, and some backends even do not implement it at all, so this is kind of a crazy definition of busy. 
Um, there's the main problem is that it's, it's really kind of random how LibreOffice processes the stuff. So even if you say, okay, process the next uh, event or task or whatever, sometimes it processes two if a system pro uh, event is there. Sometimes it processes even two LibreOffice events. This is not really idealistic from the point of view if you want to know how stuff is running in LibreOffice. And then there are some really freaky stuff like there are some commands in the Mac OS backend where saying, oh, at some time we are losing timer events. Nobody knows why. It's The comments are from 2000, really, yeah. So they are quite from very old code. And yeah, so this is really what the fuck code at that point. And we have heard that uh, today in the talk from Michael Meeks about the, the pr parallel processing with, to uh, with threads that already there are some, a lot of problems there. And in, when I was started and looking into this code, I can understand why there are problems because it seems that everybody just, for every bug in that code, they implemented workarounds instead of rewriting this, the whole stuff from scratch with a normal idea. And how, in a normal way, normal tasks and event loops working today in toolkits. So, where we are to currently is um, we it's only scheduled by priority now. So, like all the normal event loops, uh, every event or task has a priority and is scheduled like that. Um, so, we do ignore completely those busy stuff. That's really crazy anyway. Um, the other thing is that LibreOffice was more or less polling with a task which just occurred because we were missing some time, time or task sometimes. So, we started just to poll. So, in case we missed something, we found a way to continue the stuff. Uh, the single uh, system timers work except for macOS because I don't have a macOS platform yet. Huh, I will get one. Uh, yeah, sometimes I have to force them, and then I hopefully can fix the macOS backend too, that it has a, a single system timer. Then there was a strange yeah, feature that every task has to wait at least one millisecond for whatever reason. I don't know, this was very strange too. I, I dropped that too, and I didn't see anything why that couldn't work in the future. At least the, all the unit tests which were there still are working. Um, the refactoring of all those codes made also the, uh, I made it in that way that all single tasks uh, and patches passed all the unit tests and even I added some more unit tests to test real strange stuff like round robin when we have two tasks with the same priority. They are currently scheduled. No, they are not scheduled because then first, the first task is uh, working all the time until it is finished, even if it's processed multiple times. And then the second task is just tackling and a little around driving at that point, fix that too. Um, um, and one really stressful test, which I find, uh, because sometimes I cha really made bugs in it, and all the unit tests still passed, but the desktop unit tests and LibreOffice Kit unit tests are so complex that normally they instantly fail if, I, if something is wrong in the event management or in the task handling. So that's the current status. Uh, yeah, missing is basically the macOS stuff. So what, where we are coming to is that we run uh, the LibreOffice uh, event loop just from the system timer. Um, we don't have the polling, so we just restart the system timer to, uh, to execute exactly when the next uh, task is valid, or even if it's zero seconds, uh, we instantly return and process that. We, I had the, yeah, the strange, situation when I refactored some code and merged it that it became faster, that unit tests broke because they were too fast. But I fixed those unit tests now. And what we are going uh, want and want to have is to have uh, locking. So currently the the unit the main loop is not uh, multi-threading safe. 
Uh, we have already have those problems where some events and or tasks are created in another thread and then are run in the main loop and then stuff simply breaks. And we want to get that too. This is currently hard because uh, the tasks are owned by their threads. So I, it's really basically the only solution to that is currently to have a main global lock for the event loop and lock it, and so you can release the stuff. All other event loops oh, have. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, six and a half we minutes. A few, we have a few times. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, I think. Something. Yeah, I do. Yeah. All the other similar event loops are just not owning the tasks, and they're normally owned by the event loop, and we want to have that in Libros too. It's crazy stuff. Get rid of it. Thanks for looking into this. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, my main. Uh, original point was that something changed in there and mail merge got very, very, something changed in that code and mail merge got very, very slow for more than 300 documents and I said, wow, and every time I thought I fixed it, I found something new. It's crazy. And it's still a little bit hard because, yeah, it's the very low ground and plumbing in LibreOffice and if you change something there, everything breaks basically. It's a little bit hard. I don't remember what it was, but when I debugged something last time, I saw that it was just event handling and looping and all the stuff that could be fixed with your one millisecond to zero millisecond step. That's Probably. our sums. I mean, I already landed some re refactoring patches, but the really hard stuff is yeah. hopefully landing in the Hackfest next Monday, Tuesday. Uh, probably that was a little bit too long for lightning talk. Please. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> you've been you've been very kind with me, very disciplined presenters. Thanks for that. You've been a wonderful audience. Thanks for that. Um, we have five minutes left. Um, what I would be curious to hear is some feedback from you guys. So, what was the talk that you missed that was not here in the staff room? So that we should really have next year, or any other feedback? You, you want to say something? I so see I it. Want to say something. I'm only a user of that, <laughs> and I use it uh, maybe half a year, no longer. Because uh, before I came from Windows, and then they changed to Windows 10, and then I changed to Linux, and I'm happy with that, but there is no office, and I need an office, and so I use the LibreOffice. That's all. So, so you would have liked some some more uh, user-focused uh, topics, or I mean, there was this LibreLax that was clearly um, I really love it. I'd like to try that really when, I, when, when the code is out. It was okay for me. Okay, he says it was okay. <laughs> cool. Yes, it's more technical and I'm more user. That's interesting what, what problems you have. He says it's interesting what kind of problems we have <laughs> with a smile in his face. <laughs> Anything else? Any kind of feedback? Anything at all? Otherwise, get home safely. Um, enjoy the, the rest of the Fostum. Where is the dinner tonight? 7.30. Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you.